required to meet in person. So um, the uh, if you if you want, I'm gonna I'm gonna send it to our listserv too if uh, if um, they give me permission to, and I think that they will. Um, mm-hmm. But then everyone can sign up for all the wonderful things that they're going to have on offer. And I encourage anybody to um, get in touch with them for the uh, all the meetings they have virtually because they meet at least three times every single day um, of mm-hmm. the week during the week. Um, and it's just I, I think it's been an extremely um, positive thing for our our family members even for me to have that very strong yeah. connection continue during the pandemic. So I, I Sarah, can, yeah, what Alvin? Sarah, no, I was, no, I just wanted to concur with you and that it's been a lifesaver for my family as well. Could you yeah. also mention that the, that the zoom things are free of charge and that's mm-hmm. amazing. So I'm starting the live so now we, we, guys. The, yes. Thank you. Joe. The, thank you. Joe. The Go ahead. Actual, Go ahead. Uh, no, I was going to say that the zoom, uh, me free of charge and and you're right it's been such a lifesaver to our families in this community um, yeah. getting us through the pandemic so mm-hmm. absolutely patronize them oh I mean what, just just as an example um, there have been many many more hours of connection with people than would have ever been possible if they were strictly in person and right. it's it's real. It's it's mm-hmm. real. They I, so I so appreciate what they've been doing, and um, I, I'm I'm glad that we support them, and um, that that'll continue also. Um, so those are those two things. Remember that April 26th, um, and and I'm going to be sending out an announcement when he has the full flyer ready for me. Uh, Brent Claiborne has the flyer ready for me about the. Um, sexuality in IDD individuals, um, it's, um, it's going to last two hours, an hour and a half plus 30 minutes of question and answer. So that's, that's going to be a, okay. a, That's a doctoral student, I believe, right? Oh, it, yeah, if I could. It is. It is. Okay. I can't think of her name, but yes, it's a doctoral student. And I yeah. guess the plan is to meet with the parents first. And then we will collectively decide if that's something that we want to bring our individuals in on after that. That's right. So that's right. I think yes. That's a really yes. Great thing. Yes. Good point, Alva. It's uh, the our um, individuals who, um, in our case, are on the autism spectrum, or mm-hmm. uh, they're not going to be included in the this first one. So they're they're going to sort of gauge the um, interest and need in having a follow up that does include yes. um, those those people. And yes, uh, I brought it up. I found it. It's going to um, our the speaker they're going to have is Lindsay Mullis, um, who's an M uh, Lindsay Mullis M S, and she's in the she is the inclusive health and wellness director for the Kentucky Inclusive Health Co- Health Collaborative at University of Kentucky's Human Development Institute. She has an educational background in psychology, exercise science, and a lot of other things. Um, She's pursuing a PhD, yes, in health education sciences with disability and sexuality focus. So that's just Mm -hmm. perfect. They they did a great job of Mm -hmm. finding the right speaker for that. Um, Okay, Um, getting back to everything that we need to talk about tonight. Um, uh, I want to um, and make everybody aware that later that just coincidentally that same day, but they're, they're doing theirs earlier in the day, but our next meeting uh, is gonna be April 26th and it will feature Dr. Paul Wayman of Virginia Commonwealth University. And he'll be discussing employment and people with significant support needs. We don't have a meeting in May because of Memorial Day. And then uh, we don't have a date set yet, but in the summer, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Myra Beth Bundy on obtaining an ASD diagnosis in adulthood. Okay, does anyone else know of any other um, uh, announcements on our end? Melanie, Joe? Alva? Okay, then. All right, Melanie, would you like to look at our list of 
speakers that we're going to have just briefly uh, talking about some special announcements they need to be make they need to make sure. at the start of our meeting. Yes, we have um, Caitlin Stone who is um, doing a research study. And um, let me just introduce everybody real quick. And then we have um, uh, Stevie Ogborn, am I saying that? Ogburn, excuse me, who uh, has another research study. And then we have, I'm thinking uh, John Stewart might be from the Sparks program at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I hope that's correct. Um, but we have three different groups um, just talking really briefly to, to us tonight. Um, He's shaking about, his head no, that must not oh, be right. <laughs> excuse me, Mr. Stewart, my apologies, uh, my apologies. But there, we were going to have somebody from the um, uh, Spark study at uh, from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So maybe I've, maybe that person will get on later. Um, but why don't we, if it's okay, why don't we start with uh, Caitlin Stone, Sloan? Uh, can you want to tell us a little bit about your study? Yes, um, so I'm Caitlin Sloan. I am a speech therapist at UK and I'm also a doctoral student in the RHB program. Um, I work with Patty, um, <laughs> research studies with HDI, and then Stevie and I have worked um, together as well um, <laughs> so for some um, study design types of things. So I know a lot of you all on here. Um, but what I wanted to share with you all is a research opportunity. Um, it's through HDI. Um, and really what we're going to focus on is AAC, AAC with adults. And I'm assuming that all of you all know what AAC is. Is that, do you all know what that is? Or you want me to kind of go over that? Why don't you explain it? Just what the, the letters mean? Yes. So um, AAC is augmentative and alternative communication. Um, so it's um, all forms of communication except um, oral or verbal speech that someone uses to express themselves. Um, so this can be unaided forms like facial expressions or gestures or sign language or aided forms like pictures, communication devices, um, and those types of things. Um, so what we're hoping to do with our study is to um, look at what the facilitators and barriers are for um, adults with developmental disabilities um, who need or use AAC and their ability to communicate. Um, and we also wanna look at what their caregivers think, what their care providers think, and then any service providers like OTs, speech therapists, and PTs. And the reason why we're wanting to do this is because a lot of adults will leave high school without a good way to communicate. And so we're wanting to gain some more information into why that occurs, um, what is needed to improve that. And then we wanna develop some trainings um, for service providers to kind of improve that access. And it's interesting, some of the things that you guys were talking about earlier, like um, communicating about, you know, sexuality, those type of things, or communicating um, if someone were to like harm them in some way, um, that's, it's really important that they have that, not just for participation, but for some safety reasons as well. Um, so we're wanting to look more um, at that. And with our study, um, it's all going to be through Zoom. Um, we were a little concerned with COVID when we started planning this, so um, everything's going to be through Zoom. What we'll do at first, if um, anyone is interested, is we'll do like a screening type of meeting first, where we ask to make sure that um, whoever wants to participate meets those <laughs> guidelines. Um, and then um, kind of our inclusion for the study. And then past that, we'll do some interviews. And we'll, the interviews can either be one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom with me, or it can be in a group of other people as well. And so it's just kind of based on the preference of whoever wants to participate um, as far as that goes. And so really it's gonna take an hour or less of um, your time or um, the, the adult with AAC's time, um, but we really just wanna get um, some more information so we can help this um, population. And so autism is one of the um, developmental disabilities in adults that we see frequently. So that's why we're reaching out to you all. Um, do you have any questions about that? What I'll do, if, if you guys are interested or if you think you know someone that might be interested, I'm gonna put my email in the chat and you can send them my email and then um, I can follow up with them or follow up with you all. Uh, just to, to clarify, Caitlin, um, mm -hmm. now, I know some people through this group that um, 
They maybe not don't have like a full blown AAC system, but they'll use writing notes. Sometimes they'll use texting or communicating through an app. And I just want to clarify that that's probably you're probably looking for those kind of people too. Yeah, right? yeah. Thank you, Patty, for bringing that up because that's one of the questions I keep getting. It doesn't have to be, you know, like a communication device like you would think of. It can be any form, and they actually don't. Um, the participants don't even have to use AAC. It could just be like, you know, they might need something to help them communicate sometimes, and um, you want them to be included in the study as well. So um, it it can be anybody really. Thank you so much for letting me talk. No, thank you for coming. And I, we have gotten your um, your email outreach, and we will um, forward that to the listserv. I don't, I think, I think it has not gone to our listserv yet, but we'll send it to the listserv, and um, that has all the particulars you want to go to everyone, Caitlin. Yes, and okay. then if they have any more questions, I can follow up and answer specific right. questions. Yeah, we'll direct them that way. So, all right, thank you for coming and for working on that and letting us know about it. Yeah, yeah Patty. Sarah, I think maybe Lisa has posted about this. I've seen it. Oh, okay. On Facebook or on the list several times. So, I just, the word is getting out there, Caitlin. Yeah, right. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just um, did a search of my email and I saw that it, some. I don't see anything that has gone out to the listener, but it, but it may have. So we'll see about that. Okay. Um, Melanie, who is next? Yes. Um, we have Stevie Og Ogburn. Make sure I'm saying that right. She is a, a doctoral student, master's student working. Master's. Okay. Master's student working on her degree. And she's got a really neat um, uh opportunity for uh, families of young children. It's a part of her, her research. Yeah, thank you, Mel, for that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Stevie, and I am a master's student in the um, Applied Behavior Analysis Master's Program here at UK, and I am also doing a research study right now, um, still to do with communication, so a little bit like Caitlin's, but kind of the opposite end of she's working with adults and I am looking for uh, families who have a child between the ages two and five. Um, and what my research, what I'm gonna be doing is training parents and coaching parents via Zoom also, um, families that are located in rural parts of Kentucky. Yes, I, I see a thumbs up from Sarah. So I myself am from a town called Sanders, Kentucky. Um, there's a there's a whole 200 people here, and very underserved community. Um, what county? Carroll County. Oh wow. Mm -hmm. And so growing up here and graduating and me like I didn't realize that this wasn't the norm until I left, <laughs> and then I went to Georgetown College for my undergrad, and now I'm at UK, and I'm like, wow, there are so many resources out here but we can't get anything out there. And so in May, I'm gonna graduate and I'm moving back here. And my end goal is to open a clinic here for the tri like county area so that we do have some sort of resources because it's not like people who live in rural Kentucky don't also have autism. <laughs> but so my thesis research is taking that first step to try and reach families in rural communities and, you know, give them those same resources that we give families, you know, in the city. Um, so I'm going to be coaching families via telehealth. It'll be a Zoom meeting for one hour a week, and I'm coaching them some naturalistic language strategies to use with their child that's minimally verbal, um, so about less than 20 words, um, and just some strategies to use during play, and these strategies are have been shown in research to, to increase the child's expressive language. Um, so, so I'm super excited about that. I've worked, I'm not sure if you all are familiar with Dr. Justin Lane at UK, but I've worked on research with him and I've, I've seen the strategies and I've, I've coached teachers and I've done them myself, but now I'm taking it on my own path and kind of 
fixing in what I'm also passionate about, which is reaching these families who really need these resources and what better way to do it whenever it's, I'm a student and it's free. So. <laughs> oh, Stevie, Stevie, I really admire that. We're really excited. In fact, you know, develop UK developmental, we'll be sending you, we'll probably take care. How many, how many kids are you looking for? I like, am looking for at least two. Oh, right pshaw. <laughs> We've got that. Yeah. Mel and I have that taken care of. We probably have to take care of tomorrow. Perfect. I'm, hey, I'm ready to start. I'm ready to go whenever they are. Um, I will also drop my email in the chat here and, you know, just send anyone my email and I can um, talk to them about any more questions they have and really get into um, my participant requirement. Um, but this is something that hopefully because we have something like this called the PACE program that we're doing through our program right now. And it's basically exactly what I'm doing, but in person. But I was hoping to kind of talk to Dr. Lane and put a little bug in his ear about telehealth and reaching those families in rural communities, especially now with, I mean, we're on a year of this pandemic now and mm -hmm. everything someone, most people have done something over Zoom at this point. And so a lot more people are familiar with telemedicine and telehealth. And so I feel just like this is the perfect time to do something oh. like this. There it is, okay. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, you say, you talk about the disparity between the more populated areas and those that are more rural. Even in the populated areas, there's so much lacking. I mean, yes. you know, it's, we're not just filled to the brim. And when you look at the, the areas that are farther afield, it's just that much worse. So yes. that I, I have noticed, even like you said, in, you know, Louisville and Lexington, the in most, the biggest cities in Kentucky, I think Kentucky as a whole is still far behind. Um, there were, I've done a lot of traveling this past year and a lot on the West Coast. And I was going to move out there after graduation. And then I realized that Kentucky needs my services a lot more than any state out West needs me. Yes. And so I uh, made a big life change. <laughs> of oh, This is where you. I need to be. This is, this is where I'm needed right now. And so so I'm, I'm excited and I've, I've been, I got a job offer in Florence, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, and they asked, one of my questions in the interview was, you know, what, how are you all branching out to the communities around you? Because that's Boone County and all the counties South from there are rural and underserved and mm -hmm. have no resources. And they said they had, you know, talked about it but that they needed someone to kind of come in and take the reins. And I was like, Hey, <laughs> I'm there. Oh, Stevie, that is just phenomenal. Yeah. The West coast for years has, has been, yes. yeah. they, <laughs> they got been, covered over there. Oh, they they've been so far ahead with ABA, yes. for example, forever. And mm -hmm. it's just, that is so wonderful that you have made that sacrifice yes. to stay back here. Thank you. I'll make a comment. Please do. So it doesn't have anything to do with ABA, but it does have something to do with Carroll County and Carrollton. So you're from Sanders. Yes. My, my father was, um, I'm a physician. My father is Frankfurt's first radiologist. And when he started, yeah. he's a native of Frankfurt, but when he started his practice in 1956, he used to drive once a week to uh, Carrollton and read x -rays. And so he's the first guy to come there in the 1950s and read x-rays in Carroll County. Wow. You go one day a week to Shelbyville and read x-rays at their hospital and one day a week to Carrollton and read x-rays at their hospital. Wow, that's amazing. And he, lo he loved to drive because he, he could go fast and he never, there never. <laughs> <call>. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that is amazing. Yep. That tells you where the needs are. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you for talking to yeah. us about it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. For to say, talk. Yeah. As Go a ahead, Caitlin. Californian, as a native Californian who came from actually the mine is Davis and then to Memphis, I don't think you're making a sacrifice. You know, I really <laughs> like this. I really like Lexington and Kentucky. So it's a good place. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, we're lucky you, you all think so. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do we have anyone else who needs to make an announcement, Melanie? I don't think so. I don't really think we have anybody from the that Sparks program at Cincinnati Children's. So I will. Um, I, I know. Um, I, anyway, so we've got the we've got Dr. Allen to speak, but then we've got the governor's lieutenant governor's video message so okay. i don't know what the sequence you want to do that in. yeah i would go ahead and do that caitlin do you mind if we go ahead and play her announcement okay thank you okay. all right joe are you ready with that um actually i tried to open that and it <laughs> didn't work and i sent oh, great. Out a message about that it said that the file transfer has expired oh my gosh you're kidding i'm not oh, no. kidding um <laughs> That's kind what, of how my life is gone. Can, I, can my I file is expired. What what exactly <laughs> is it? I'll it's tell just a, it's a oh it did expire. It basically it's a little video um, blog of her saying talking about um, April is autism uh, acceptance month. Okay, who? Uh, Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline Col Coleman. Jacqueline Coleman. Well, mm -hmm. rats. Oh, we can buy a new one for eight hundred dollars. This looks like here. Um, <laughs> anyway, I don't know what to. Do. I'm so sorry, okay. you guys. Well, um, we can just we can just say here that that the the state government has proclaimed April Autism Acceptance Month yes. in okay. Kentucky. Because yeah. when I originally sent it to her, I I said I would need it before. March 22nd and not realizing that our meeting was the 29th. So maybe what I'll do is I'll circle around back to that office and see if they can re uh, un unexpire the file so we can we can use it. Oh, okay. that bums me out. I'm so oh, sorry. Well. That's okay. Thank you for thank you for trying. <laughs> okay, with um, with that, we can go ahead and begin our meeting and I will read for those who, of you who have not uh, received the flyer for tonight's meeting, um, a little biography of our speaker we're so glad to have, Dr. Caitlin Allen. Dr. Caitlin Allen, PhD, is a licensed psychologist and associate professor of pediatrics in developmental pediatrics at the University of Kentucky and University of Kentucky Healthcare. She specializes in the assessment of neurodevelopmental disorders and has worked with individuals diagnosed on the autism spectrum for over 30 years in many different capacities, including teaching preschool as a behavior technician and ABA supervisor. She also works with women in recovery from substance use disorders and their children at Beyond Birth Comprehensive Recovery Center through UK Psychiatry teaching parenting skills. She is the mother of two ostensibly neurotypical children, ages 12 and 21, and is married to Kip Guy, Dean of the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. She also lives with two standard poodles and a French bulldog, grand dog, who belongs to her 12-year-old. Oh. And I'm hoping we're not going to hear the French bulldog because he likes to sit outside the door. <laughs> so if you hear horrible noises coming, it's, it's my dog. You no, know, because he's like, well, you know, we didn't get the lieutenant governor, so we have space. Sorry. Okay. All right. And, and I am here, but I'm going to have to probably go dark because I tend to have a bad connection. And so just in hopes that I can maintain a connection, I'll turn off my camera. But Caitlin, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. It's lovely to be here. So I do have some slides. I thought oh, I probably should prepare slides. I can also go without slides. I guess I'm going to try to share my screen. Is that Right. So let's, and you know, if I don't have slides, I can. You should be able to share your screen. Okay. okay. Let's see. If you're not, let me know. Um, and also, anybody who's watching, if you have questions, remember to use the, the reactions button at the bottom of the screen and raise your hand, or you can put uh, post questions in the chat and we will try to look at them. Screen. 
Oh, there you I... go. Oh. You're seeing my very messy screen. Okay, let me put this here and take that there. And you can see all the crazy things I have on my screen. Let's see, where am I going? Parent kids. No, wait, that's not right. Uh, I pulled it out and I stuck it up here. Oh, Zoom. And I can I can run I can try to get it. Uh, I've got it. I've got oh, it. Just, okay. Just, yeah, I just have to. Okay. Find it again. Look, there it is. Okay. Oh, yay! I know, right? Oh, shoot. So let's see. So do I, I want to go to slideshow? And, oops. I'm beginning. Okay, all right. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you guys about executive function and autism. Executive function is a really large term, and it refers to, let's see if I got this tricky thing that's going to go, or maybe not, nope, a set of skills that can help someone to plan ahead and meet goals, display self-control, follow multiple step directions, even when interrupted, and stay focused, and more. So in the old days of DSM-4 and DSM-4TR, we did not break out autism. We just assumed people with autism had executive function problems. Um, so, we never said someone had autism and ADHD. You could only have autism. So we often think of executive deficits as uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, so ADHD. But pretty much everybody with ASD has issues with executive function, but most people with ADHD do not have ASD. So I'm trying to... <laughs> So what happens for us in developmental, in the clinic, we get a lot of kids who the caregiver brings them in and says, you know, this kid is unusual in their behavior. We think they might have a touch of the autism. So we get that a lot. Um, and when we meet the child, who's actually usually very social, very friendly, very interactive with us, we can pretty much definitively say, no, they don't have autism, but they sure have some executive function issues. So when we're looking at executive function skills, the kind of things that we see in people who are having problems with them are issues like um, the inability to inhibit responses. So that's the thing before you act. Uh, a child who, well, I mean, we all know them, right? They get the idea to do something, they just have to do it. And oftentimes, if you ask them, why did you do that? They won't be able to tell you. Um, people with executive function issues often have uh, difficulty controlling their emotions, managing their emotions. And the biggest hallmark for people who also have autism spectrum disorders is the lack of flexibility. So the measure I really like to use when I'm assessing people for um, an executive function disorder is something called the brief. Um, and the brief is great because it's a, it's a parent measure and it seems to do a really good job at getting at executive function, which can be pretty, pretty hard to um, assess outside of the self-report or the parent parental report. So we try to do it in the laboratory, we try to do it in clinic, and it's just, it's a, it's a tough thing to assess. Oftentimes kids will look better one-on-one -on -one with me than they can in the classroom or, or even at home. 
So by using a parent measure like the breathe, we can assess what's going on better. So the flexibility issue is the major one in autism. And if I'm kind of on the fence of whether or not someone has autism versus just ADHD, um, we often look for a spike on that flexibility. Although people who just have straight up ADHD will also show it. Working memory is a huge, huge um, area. And it's that ability to keep more than one thing in mind. So to solve a problem, to um, you know, just get things done. Working memory plays a huge role in academic skills and is one of the best predictors of whether or not someone will have um, difficulty going on and um, doing well in, in a school setting. So um, we like to say, Dan Laro, who's the developmental pediatrician I work with, likes to call it the bucket skill. And um, he'll say, you know, this kid has, some people have a big bucket, some people have a thimble. And oftentimes the kids that come to see us have a thimble. So what happens is you say, hey, I need you to go get this and this, and they start to go and then they've forgotten everything else. So another thing that we see a lot of the time with people who have ASD is difficulty with task initiation. So that's just getting started. Like, how do I even get started with the task? So, um, and then of course, sustained attention. How do you do a task even if it's boring? With our kids with ADHD, this is when chairs get thrown, tables get flipped over because it's boring and they just don't want to do it. Um, planning and prioritization is also one of those executive function skills, as is organization, as is time management, as is goal-directed persistence, and metacognition. Metacognition is really interesting for us when we're looking, working with people who have an ASD diagnosis, because that's kind of the theory of mind. So sometimes when parents are confused and they think a child with just ADHD might have autism, they're seeing that metacognition, which is also affected by a executive function impairment. So we know theory of mind is the ability to think about someone. It's also called mentalization. It's a, the ability to think of someone else and, and kind of figure out that they, how they're feeling. So these are things that we see a lot. And that's kind of the overlap between ADHD and ASD. So what do you do about it? Well, starting off when a baby is little, those things that we do instinctively to um, just interact with a child are really, really important. Peekaboo with an infant is the foundation for working memory. So then you kind of go, well, you know, that's great and all, Caitlin, but many babies with ASD don't respond. So what are you going to do with them? Well, we're going to use things like Sally Rogers, um, Early Start Denver model, straight up ABA, whatever we can do to help them build those neural pathways so that they too can start developing those executive function skills. So, you know, the thing about executive function is nobody is born with it. We have the genetic um, predisposition to, to develop it, but it's a skill that can be learned and can be built upon. The other thing about executive function that you need to keep in mind is that oftentimes it's inherited. It's very genetic. Um, we like to say in our clinic, it's more genetic than height or eye color. Um, I don't have any, any actual reference for that, but it is very, very inherited. So sometimes these interventions can be really hard. When I say, you know, to a family, you need to establish routines and they've never had a routine in their family, it's tough. So we like to encourage families to have routines because that helps kids figure out what to do. We like to encourage scaffolding and breaking the big tasks into smaller pieces. And all of us who work with 
people who have a diagnosis on the autism spectrum know that that's what we need to do to get things done. And it also works for people with ADHD. We need to take things and make them into smaller pieces. Um, encourage games and activities that promote rule following, role playing, and controlling impulses. So here, these kids are playing Simon Says. So almost everything that we used to do in the 60s and 70s is something that helps develop executive function. Other interventions we really, really like to see kids do is uh, martial arts if they're able. Therapeutic writing is also very good. One of the things about therapeutic writing that we really like is that it seems to work with this, the um, cerebellum. And we used to think that executive function was mostly confined to like the frontal dorsal lateral cortex, but we know that it actually is broader than that. And it's really your whole brain. So whole brain health and riding a horse kind of stimulates the cerebellum and can really help kids get more regulated. We like to recommend competitive swimming. Uh, Michael Phelps was um, the gold medalist, he was notoriously ADHD, so pretty severely executive function deficit. And then also yoga, meditation, anything we can do to help kids become more mindful and more aware of what's going on in their body. Sleep is huge. Many children will present as looking like they have ADHD and have kind of unusual behaviors when really they may be significantly sleep deprived. So this is, you know, what we, what we want to strive for. And some, of course, some kids take more sleep and some kids take less sleep. But if your child is not sleeping, it's hard for their brain to work the way it should. Limiting screen time is also very, very important as an intervention for having executive function issues. Um, and generally these kids, when they come into our clinic, because remember we're seeing the most extreme, I think, um, everybody's on a phone in the family, uh, people are playing games. It's generally a family and we'll actually have parents on their phones while we're trying to give feedback or interview them. So we wanted to okay. It seems like a lot of kids with executive function deficits find the screen really, really reinforcing, and they want to do it to the exclusion of all other activities. So a really long time ago, I had a professor say to me, you know, you're only, you build the neural pathways for what you practice. So if we're trying to encourage people to be more pro-social and to communicate and just be with other humans and, and do things, they can't be on their screen all the time. So we have to find other activities for them to do. And it's hard because that means their parents who are on the screens too will have to interact with them more. All right. So in some cases, we do recommend medication, usually not until people are at least five years of age. It's interesting, I was talking about DSM-4 and DSM-4TR back when we didn't break out ADHD and autism. And some of the first studies for medication with people with autism actually looked at using stimulant medications and they were helpful. So if we're having problems getting um, someone to be able to focus and attend and we tried strategies like modifying the environment and you know, direct teaching and all kinds of things like that and it's not working, sometimes medication can be very helpful. So I think that's all I have for you. I kind of zipped through this. Um, so does anybody have any questions? Caitlin, this is Mel. Yeah. Help me, like when you um, are, are trying to um, make a distinction between, like where does the, I'm probably not asking it very clearly, but where does, so one end and the other begin, or do they get all mushed together? 
they totally get mushed together. <laughs> get mushed together when it's ASD and autism or um, ADHD and autism. So what we're looking for, of course, you know, autism is primarily a social disorder. Mm -hmm. So if I have someone who is very social and very reciprocal and very interactive, I'm not going to say that they have autism, but they sure have ADHD. Um, if I, it's that, that fine line. Okay. Yeah. And because I think that what, what I, and you guys, you guys jump in if I'm not saying this correctly, but we see, we have a lot of families that the child gets identified with autism and then the parent starts kind of seeing you know some of those actual and sometimes they do they truly do have autism but yes. sometimes but then other times it might be something else is that fair to say Abs absolutely i think it's fair to say that it could be you know pretty extreme executive function deficit yeah. so adhd mm -hmm especially if they've kind of gotten along in life. We, you know, look at people who self-medicate. So mm -hmm. if you're um, a big coffee drinker and a big um, energy drink user, if you smoked, you know, caffeine and nicotine are all great ways to treat ADHD. The other thing I always look at in adults um, I had someone once in an inpatient practice tell me, you know, I need, I got to get my, my Adderall. I got to get my Adderall. And I was like, oh man, are you drug seeking? What are you doing? And, um, I started interviewing him and he was like a classic adult ADHD. He had crashed multiple cars because he was just so distracted. You know, he couldn't focus to keep this stuff together. And he was actually had been a cocaine user because that's how he treated his, that was medication he needed to keep going was you know illegal cocaine so I kind of look for patterns like that too but like you know we I think the distinctions we make and the DSM forces us to make insurance companies and the the um, uh, prop for-profit healthcare we're forced to put people in these neat little boxes yeah and times it isn't really a neat little box. So I think the, uh, the distinction between, you know, when is it ADHD, just, a, just ADHD, and when is it ASD can kind of get blurred. So, but we're specifically with ASD, you know, we're looking for um, unusual interests, repetitive behaviors, things that you typically don't see with, with ADHD. Although one of the things that a lot of parents get worried about is that a child with straight up ADHD may do this. And, you know, it's just because they're so excited and it's sort of a motor overflow. But no, it's not the same as, as stimming with ASD. Could you explain that just a little bit more with the um, difference between stimming and what you just did? Mm -hmm. um, like with ADHD, like what is the difference there? I think with ADHD, the kids are not necessarily looking and, but it's almost like jumping for joy. You know, I'm just so overwhelmed. Um, all right, again, I'm going to use another Lero, Dr. Dan Lero uh, example. Oh my God. Oh my God. You know, I've just, I've just won Miss America. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I, uh, the same as I'm sitting in the corner, you know, playing in my spit or something that's more focused. And certainly because remember kids with ASD have ADHD, we can see both. Right. Clear as mud. Right, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was super clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it, no, it, it is. It's really hard to kind of tease that out because, you know, the when I very first started working in the clinic, I would see some some characteristics of some of the families, and I'm like, I do that, I do that, right? you know. <laughs> 
and and well, but then as I learn more about it, you know, and, and I I have I guess what's called ADD, so I can't be in a situation where there's other conversations going on because I'm like squirrel, you know, I'm I'm always you know being drawn to whatever the is going on outside of you know me. So focusing is the most difficult thing I've ever had to you know I, I, it's it's very very hard for me. And so um, I remember in college when I um, was would try to study, I had to be walking on the treadmill. I would record the lecture, and then I'd have the notes in front of me. I had to get bombarded, you know, stimulation-wise, in order for it to get through my thick brain, you know, my thick skull, uh, in order to make sense of stuff. And I years later, you know, I, I start realizing those were strategies that I had to kind of used to compensate for my inability to sit and, and attend because that was that's so hard for me you know kind of thing uh, yeah and I don't and I know think, how that fits into the big picture of executive function but but I, I think just personally that's something I, I see some of the families coming in that you know struggle with this you know that either the child has it or they have it them themselves and it's like how do you you know, the most important thing is you find a solution to it because you want to, you want to, you know, live a good life and, and, and be able to, um, you know, pay attention to the things you're supposed to pay attention to. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And I think one of the other big things is Apples don't break it. Find positive things so that kids can be successful. Yeah. Everyone to have something to be successful. And when you have severe executive function deficits, you have a really hard time experiencing a traditional school environment successfully. Yeah. Because you don't do well sitting in a chair. You know, you want to get on the treadmill and you know, run 12 miles or whatever. Um, so these kids, some of whom may be exceptionally bright, you know, so we, we talk about, you know, twice um, twice exceptional, right? They have ADHD or ADHD and ASD, and they may be, you know, gifted intellectually, but they can't show us what they know because they are just, they're so distracted. They're so um, overcome. And uh, there are a lot of sensory things I think that go along. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. This Dr. Too. Allen, I have, a, I have another question. So the question is, have you dealt with anybody who has the symptoms of ADHD, but is also a, a carrier of something genetic? So like in my case, my son has Christensen syndrome and then I'm a carrier, but I've also been diagnosed with ADHD. So have you dealt with anything like that before? Well, only probably with your son and you know <laughs> it does it is comorbid there, there are different genetic syndromes and um, we have a wonderful uh, fellow neurology genetics fellow working with us and you know we'll have to see if we can no we'll have to see if we can get Neil to come in and, and do a talk about that but yeah. Yeah, absolutely I mean when we look at like, you know fragile x has severe anxiety and anxiety runs in the families so definitely when we see genetic mutations, we can see some interesting behavioral things that really until fairly recently, we weren't smart enough to pick up and notice medical community. Yeah, I've just found it very fascinating and interesting with, um, with what we found out with Thatcher and his, um, his rare condition, but also how the the fact that I carry it affects me and yes. we're still learning. And we've actually found um, four girls who have the same syndrome that he does. And it's an X linked disorder, but we found four girls who have it and hmm. they, they carry another, um, they carry another genetic mutation that basically cancels out their good X chromosome. Hmm. So it's just weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so, you know, the story, um, the Mind Institute at UC Davis had this, has this amazing um, Fragile X 
clinic and, and researchers. And they started noticing, they're looking at all these little boys who have straight up fragile X and their mothers and sisters had severe anxiety. And somebody was finally smart enough to go, hey, and you know, really, cause the whole, the whole genome sequencing and everything is so new. Um, I don't know if I've told this group this story before, but you know, I was part of the Autism Genetic Research Exchange Agree back in the early 2000s. And um, I, which was part of Cure Autism Now, CAM, remember the very, very old days. And they flew me around the country and I did something called the ADI. So that we could bring a phlebotomist in to take blood. And we thought that once we got 100 families, we would cure autism. We would, we would go, okay, it's this gene. We know what it is. Well, so here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so we're still very, it's a very, um, we're very, it's very new. I mean, I think we're still just on the cusp of learning more and learning more about the behavioral interactions. And, you know, I mean, conditions like Rett syndrome used to be DSM-4 as part of the pervasive developmental disorders because we didn't really have a test for it. We just knew that if a little girl started wringing her hands and, and experiencing um, regression and her developmental milestones, she probably had Rett's and, and, you know, that was that. But now we can actually test them. And so they've taken Rett syndrome out of the neurodevelopmental disorders in DSM. It's, it's now, you know, gets to be, it's on disorder. So I'm thinking more and more things are going to be like that once we have diagnostic tools. Yeah, we had, we had um, Del Delwyn Jacob Jacoby come and yeah. talk and it was fascinating because um, she, and I think several of us ended up deciding to have the, the genetic testing done on our, on our adult children Hi. because there was a... Um, <laughs> because that's Brayden, um, but because <laughs> because there was you know just there's the science is gone, so it, it, it's been added to so much. Okay, you you go, goodbye. Okay, but it, it's just it, it it's gone come come so far in the last what twenty five years. So yeah. you know and and I know which you know like Joe got testing done on Thatcher and. And I, we haven't completed it yet with Jay, but I'm, I'm just really curious, you know, because I think we'll, I don't know that we'll have any answers or, but it's just another piece of the puzzle, so to speak, kind of under, just getting a, a sense of, you know, gosh, are there other things that are, that go along with his genetic profile that, that maybe influence why he is the way he is? I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm looking forward to learning more about it, see what, it, see where it takes us. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's exciting, you know, to think. Yeah. Dr. Allen, I have a question. Is it possible to, um, it may not be possible to generalize about this, but do you think that it is observed that people with executive function disorders over a lifetime present differently and hmm. possibly in the way that Melanie was talking about her coping mechanisms in college? I mean, do do you think that it looks different? I mean, for something different, her, her covenant mechanisms for something different, but uh, do you think that um, it looks different in an adult who's had a lifetime of having to try to overcome challenges in that way? Yes, yes, absolutely. So we see a lot of adults, you know, certainly the women that I work with with substance use disorder have a, a history of just, you know, executive function kind of means that you make really bad choices. It's that, holy cow, what made you think that it was a good idea to, you know, jump in the car and at 14 and, and drive over to Arby's? I mean, what, what were you thinking? That kind of, you know, just, holy cow. Um, in my family, we 
it, it's kind of because, you know, I am who I am. Um, my 12 year old will say, you know, boy, I have this kid in my class and boy, does he have some executive function deficits, you know? <laughs> you hear about this, Shameless, the show Shameless on HBO. I mean, come on, the, the entire family, that's like no executive function whatsoever. You look at the Gallery family and you go, holy crap, you people are really smart, but you know, yeah, that's my therapy. I watch Shameless and go, oh. My, my husband is right there with you, yeah. yeah. I don't think he diagnosed them though. So you watch it through a different lens. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I, I kind of think executive function deficit is, you know, maybe, maybe 200 years ago, um, those people were at the OK Corral, you know, shooting one another and robbing banks and Billy the Kid. <laughs> Uh, you know, so there was a place for them in the Wild West. But now, as we're more civilized, you know, what are we going to, where, where do you, they go? What do they do? Mm-hmm. How can we help them be more successful? Mm-hmm. So there's an amazing researcher um, named Adele Diamond, and she does some really great stuff. And she's out of mm-hmm. British. And she says the best way to help kids, neurotypical and otherwise, develop executive function is to let them do things like, you know, play in the mud, dam up streams, all that great, you know, run around with sticks, uh, climb to <laughs> all those really important things that a lot of kids aren't able to do right now or aren't mm-hmm. doing. So. Hmm. Dr. Allen, I have a question. Yeah. Um, with the genetic testing and uh, Naya, We've never been um, like we've never been asked about or talked to about genetic testing. Um, with you doing this for so long, have you have you seen or been able to? Um, I guess like connect certain things in African American kids and in the difference between. Um, non-ethnic kids like is there something that you all look for specific no and i have to say you know non-anglo kids are so it's such a small you're so underrepresented even though we know that you know rates are just the same so i would say um we probably need to test anaya because you know at the very least, if she does have something that, you know, we want her sister, we want to know. So her sisters um, will know that going on, going forward, right? Um, but absolutely, I mean, I, I think it's one of the travesties in medicine, right? You know, that we know that black kids get diagnosed later uh and are more likely i mean i remember i think i must have been in memphis and i had a kid come in at like six and he was nonverbal, and he was one of the most classically autistic kids i've ever seen and the pediatrician was saying oh yeah he just has adhd and i'm like really you know um no no he doesn't he has autism i mean he may have adhd too but he has autism and he needs treatment and he needs to have the same interventions, you know, anybody else. Because of course his parents were like, you know, there's something wrong with our kid and you know, the pediatrician kind of blew him off. So, you know, and I can't, sometimes it's, it's all right, I'm gonna tell you guys a dark secret. Sometimes in clinic, we will say that is a funny looking kid. And when we say that FLK, we mean the child has some facial features or something where we think it's kind of unusual and it could be a syndrome. So we, we mean it, I mean, I, it comes from a place of love even though it's terrible and I, I probably should not ever say it again. Um, but you know, it's kind of strange because sometimes kids we look at and we're like, oh wow, you know, I think there's a syndrome going on here. We really need to get genetic testing. They don't have anything. So, you know, I can't tell by looking at somebody necessarily that they are going to, you know, have a positive genetic screen. So, but I, I definitely think we should get an eye. Uh, can I say one thing about that? Okay. Yeah. 
Um, I just wanted to say um, with my son's rare genetic condition, they didn't even find that particular gene until 2012. Yeah. Or some, sometime around then. So um, just because you get a negative genetic test now doesn't mean that five years down the road, you aren't going to get something that's positive. Because the whole world of genetics is changing so rapidly. Moment by moment, moment by moment, Joe. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So Dr. Allen, in genetic testing, is it something that we, that you test the child and the parent for? It depends, but yeah, usually. And usually it can be, you know, like a cheek swab. And I is probably pretty good. We can probably convince her to let the phlebotomist take blood, right? I yeah. Mean, yeah, yeah, she's, she's easy. So we'll see, we'll see, we'll talk to, we can, um, we'll talk to Dr. Lero about it tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We also only recently found girls who had Christensen syndrome. So, I mean, that that's such a recent development that everybody in our little group has been talking about the four little girls who have this. And we're like, how? How is that even a thing? Um, and then we have one little boy who apparently he has a variant of the gene, but he hasn't officially been diagnosed with Christensen syndrome. So it's, that one's a little odd. Um, and then there's another little boy up in Canada who's, uh, her, his mother's not a carrier. He's a spontaneous mutation. Fascinating, right? And is, then there's this extremely whole, fascinating. the whole genetics and, and I, please don't get me, I, I'm really not qualified to talk about this, but the whole mosaic syndrome. So, you know, are you, like with down syndrome, are you a little bit down syndrome, you know, or a lot, it, it all depends on mosaic and maybe we'll find that with autism too. Yeah. That is, that's a very interesting thing that you say that because with Christensen syndrome, every single person we found with it has a different variant. And they have like, they all have like different things. Like it's all, it's all like several right. of the things are the same, but it's like varying levels of those things. Like, like Thatcher is potty trained, but a lot of the other boys are not. Um, and Thatcher still has a lot of ability to walk more so than a lot of the other boys. Um, and Thatcher didn't have to get a G-tube until he was 13, so pretty recent. Um, but then there are other boys who've had to go ahead and have the G-tube. And then there are boys who don't have a G-tube at all. Right? It's so, really strange. And I, you really have to give credit to the early people who were able to diagnose some of these syndromes because, wow, you know, but I think they only work because you could only go with off the phenotype. They could only diagnose the most obvious cases. Right, right. And there's, um, there's a woman I know, I'm in close contact with her. She lives in upstate New York and she has three boys with Christensen syndrome. And yeah, she's got five kids. Three of them have Christensen syndrome and they all have different variants. Wow. And wow. They're, they're all like at different levels. And she like, she explains how her, her kids walk. She says one walks like he's a little bit tipsy and one walks like a, a drunken sailor. And yeah. So, I mean, that's how she explains it. Yeah. And I can't remember what she said the other one, cause she's got three. Um, but she's just fascinated by the fact that Thatcher is potty trained. She's like, how did you? And I'm like, a lot of hard work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Allen, I have a couple of questions. Yes. You hear me. Um, the first one um, relates to the genetic testing. Is there any value or, or is there a disadvantage to, let's say, a child that's adopted, like my son, to getting genetic testing? Because I wouldn't, you wouldn't have any parental information, any biological information on, on, on him. Actually, 
it might be um, more crucial because you don't have any information. So if there was something in this background, I mean, even something, um, another, I don't know, some other health condition mm -hmm. it might give some insight. And he's an adult, he's, he's 23. Yeah, I, I still mm -hmm. might do it just to make sure that there isn't any, any hidden um, health, but you know, really I've got to defer to your physician because I am not a geneticist, I am a psychologist, so. Okay. Well, and the second question kind of pertains to um, the uh, executive functioning um, methods to increase and improve it. Um, mm -hmm. Are you of the belief that that's an opportunity throughout a person's life? And I'm speaking of not only my son, but myself. Yes. <laughs> Because we were talking yeah. about many, many things that a, a younger child or uh, could, you know, should do and things, you know, to focus on. But how about, you know, young adults and old adults like myself? Right, right. <laughs> and me, me too. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, some of the most important things I think are making sure you're getting enough sleep, mm -hmm. making sure, you know, you're getting good nutrition because mm -hmm. coming from, um, kind of the substance use disorder community, they say halt, you know, you don't want to do anything if you're hungry, um, oh, I don't even know, lonely, tired. You, you want to make sure that your brain is able to function optimally. And exercise, I mean, mm -hmm. we know that meditation, if you don't like meditation, Tai Chi, um, mm -hmm. Martin, are really, really good for the brain body connection. And that's gonna help with your executive function. You know, you had mentioned about, uh, you had mentioned creating new neural pathways. So that's doing the same thing with us um, as an older person. Absolutely. Um, yes, hmm, it's interesting. We know, we know that the brain continues to grow. We used to think it didn't, and, you know, once you, you know, you burn those neurons, you, you, you know, you're done for, but no. Is it, is it still, I, I had heard, I guess, as a, as a younger person that we only use what some small percentage <laughs> of our brain function, is that still uh, research based? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that's kind of falling by the wayside and we're realizing that there are less um, isolated areas of the brain and, and really the brain has more, um, Oh gosh, what's the word for it now? See, I'm having my executive function. Um, but I mean, we're, we're learning that the brain is really more interconnected and more of it is actually in use. Mm -hmm. so, or you can do to keep the brain active and, and um, moving forward, the better, especially for healthy. And, you know, we also know that having social connections is really, really important to keep your brain healthy and happy. So finding people that you enjoy and you can talk to and, and be around, you know, especially in these trying pandemic times is really, really important. Interesting, thank you. This has been very interesting, thank you. Oh, you're so welcome, thank you. So can- Well, can I, have you... a, I have a question. Oh, okay, I'll shut up. The, um, it's, it's, it's really back to the, you know, as a psychologist and, and just, so clinically, when, when do you start kind of the, it, or the trial and error approach, you know, from the executive or learn by your mistakes? Um, I mean, how do you determine to, to give, you know, someone that you're seeing and evaluating and <laughs> managing um, some freedom to, to, um, to, to uh, you know, out there in the real world to try to do things and, and, and then get feedback from whether the level of success or failure they have and then go from there. Do you think there's how much ability to, um, uh, that they have to, have to judge by, by how well they, they can do and how much you can coach for them? How, how do you bring that into the individual's management for- uh, Boy, boy, therapy? that's, so, um, so my, well, 
it's, it's a really big question. In fact, I think it's going to be um, a, a question that they're, they'll be talking about when they talk about employment coaching. Um, the next is that the next meeting? Yeah. Um, and the and the follow up so you can think about it is when do you start the medication? Yeah. Right. So <clears throat> we want. I mean, generally, by the time a kid comes to see us the wheels have fallen off the bus. The teachers are upset, you know, um, the family is upset, the, the child is not having any positive interactions. Uh, the family is probably having to do some pretty uh, maladaptive things to cope with this really active person, this person who's having pretty significant uh, behaviors. So, we want to, we put our interventions in place. We try to do the behavioral interventions. So we're gonna, you know, put more structure into their life and, and um, help them at school, keep them in, you know, a, maybe a one-on-one -on -one or, or in a situation where that they have more direct attention with the teacher, maybe more resource room. But generally, um, With medication, I mean, we look to see how they're responding. And if the child is not, you know, or the young adult isn't able to be successful and we can't alter the environment enough to assist them, you know, that's when we pull the trigger and we'll try usually a similar medication again, psychologist, not a psychiatrist. So um, I like to do behavioral intervention wherever possible, but it's tough because these kids have such challenging behaviors. And I think our most teachers in most classrooms are not really able to put enough supports in place. But the supports I would put in place, especially if it's an individual who has autism in addition to having ADHD, executive function, things like visual schedules, a lot of positive reinforcement, focusing on the good, catching the kid doing things right, um, really kind of changing the paradigm. I have a story, I saw a little boy recently, and his mother brought in a whole stack. I mean, this kid was little, he was like six, seven, a whole stack of um, oh, incident reports from daycare and preschool, <laughs> like, oh my God. Got, and they were, we, I mean, and we, we were reading them and we were kind of laughing because they were, they were so, I was like, these are, and, you know, and I feel bad for the teachers because I know they're overwhelmed, but they were ridiculous things. There was one where the, just really struck me. It struck me so much that I had to put a little note about it in the report that I wrote up to go to the family where um, the child, said no he actually he somebody he was in the play area and he was playing with a toy and a, another person came over and tried to take the toy from him and he said no this is i'm playing with this fabulous he's using his words i mean that is just amazing he didn't clock her he didn't you know push her he didn't he said no and they got mad at him and the teacher came over and said oh no you need to share and he said but i'm playing with it and the teacher got on him and guess what? My friend who didn't, who didn't have the executive function to control his emotions had a meltdown. He lost his cookies because this, you know, this totally, this adult was treating him in a totally unfair manner. Um, so, you know, in this case, we can try to educate the system. We can try to go in and work with the teachers, but it's really going to be tough, you know? And, and when your mom comes and brings me a stack of all the things you've done wrong, and we've got to try to educate her and the rest of the family to, you know, we need to look more positively. We need to catch this kid being good. We need to find out what he's good at. You know, he's a loving, smart child. Um, this is a kid that we ended up, you know, recommending some medication to try to help him get under control so that maybe we could change the way people viewed him, which is not, you know, in my perfect world, we would find a greenhouse for every kid and they'd go to the right place and be loved and nurtured. And, you know, we wouldn't have to do that. I'm sorry, does that answer your question? 
John, is that, yeah. I kind of feel like I- No, <clears throat> thank you, it's good. I, I won't get into other than to say that um, it, 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 it does, it's very difficult, especially when you get a stack of incident reports, that's ridiculous, I think. Oh, it was, it was ridiculous. And they, they were they, for students. They, they do all those to say how hard a time they're having. They write a whole bunch of them instead of writing one that summarizes things, but that's a different issue. The, right. uh, I'd, love, I'd love to ask um, uh, Dr. Guy about some of these, you know, the, the, the treatment for ADHD or stimulants, and there's a lot of variation in their pharmacologic action that he would know so much more about than I or we, and it's complex mm -hmm. area, and they don't all perform the same. And I've learned that really from some parents who are very knowledgeable. Yes, it's, uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a big money area, and I think once folks get on them, actually, my question is to you that would be practical is yeah, come off of of, of those medications when they've done pretty well over time, and and they're functioning satisfactorily, yeah. and they've got jobs, and they're doing doing okay, and and at what point in time it's kind of a psychological yeah. dependence, really. Right, right, it is. It is. And I, and I think, you know, you need to put all those other things in place that we talked about. So you need to, you know, really be mindful and probably work with a, a good therapist to help you. And so at the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy, Bob Kuhn is our amazing pediatric um, pharmacist, and he's going to be retiring or he is retired. I think he's on that. But he does a fabulous job. In fact, I think he's come in and spoken to um, the Autism Society of the Bluegrass before. So, but it is, it is interesting. And one of the, the good things, I guess, about stimulants is that they're metabolized really quickly. So they work fast. We know in a day or two, if a child is going to respond to a stimulant medication. And then if you, if you don't like the effect, you can stop it and every, you know, they, it's oh, and they're done. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, you're so welcome. Dr. Allen, um, for parents who probably a lot of people make their way to you through being referred by another doctor, but if there's um, a family with issues that they that they feel need to be addressed in this area, where do you send them? Where I mean, to tell us how they should get to you or if it, they're coming from elsewhere in the state, what is what is recommended for people like that? So, um, you know, I can only speak really for the University of Kentucky for the de developmental pediatrics. We need a physician referral. Um, and unfortunately we have a heck of a wait list. It is what, 18 months now, especially for older kids. Yeah, so we try. I think we're doing better, and Brandy's maybe you know, um, we're doing better at getting little people in, you know, because we want to get kid, little kids into early intervention, but it's tough with older kids. So, I mean, what are we, Brandy's, what are we running right now? Do you know? Doc, um, right now, Dr. Laro's booked out 13 months, um, and they've onboarded Dr. Tupin, who's trying to help get that wait time down. Um, kids six and under, they're still looking at a six month or longer wait um, between providers. Yeah. So it's a pretty, pretty extensive process. Yeah, yeah. So I work in an arena model with the pediatricians um, and the MDs. So I um, am usually there and I test while the pediatricians will interview the parent. Um, so I'm the person you know, doing the ADOS, doing administering whatever measures, IQ testing, whatever we need to do to try to figure out you know, how this person is functioning. Uh, so we need, we need to clone ourselves. And the problem is, I mean, there just aren't that many providers available. So we know there aren't that many developmental pediatricians out there. Um, there are not very many psychologists who do what I do. So it makes it really, really challenging. We've been talking about hiring, you know, another psychologist and I kind of laughed. I was like, you know, I get job offers all the time. 
from all over the world. New Zealand actually has been trying to recruit me, which is kind of cool. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not going to go. Don't worry. But um, there aren't a lot of people that do what we do. I can't imagine why not, because I think it's the most rewarding thing in the world. I, I love my job. But I, I think, don't, we, isn't it true that um, a lot of what occupational therapists do is targeting executive function issues? It can be. It really depends on the, on the occupational therapist. But yes, there are occupational therapists that are working on emotional regulation. You know, and that's certainly an avenue to try, um, you know, because you can probably get in sooner and see if it works. Now, some occupational therapy techniques, many are, have not really been empirically proven, but it's kind of like that placebo effect. I don't really care as long as it works. You know, brushing, we were talking about brushing. I was around in, in California when it first came out. It's wonderful because like they take the soft brush and they, I mean, who wouldn't like to have someone sit you down and, oh, would be, I just love, I, you know. Oh, it's, it's magic. Right? <laughs> right? And so I don't know if, if it's, is it doing something neurologically? Is it just that I get to spend time with someone who really cares about me and is, you know, stroking my skin with this lovely surgical brush? I mean, who knows? Who cares? If it works and it helps a kid be more successful in their environment, I, you know, I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. yeah. right, I have dogs in my door right now. <laughs> I thought I heard that for a while. Was there barking? A, did somebody bark a while ago? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is what happens when I say to the family, can you keep the dogs quiet for a mm. little bit? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Good work. Right. right. Well. <laughs> See, mom i need i need to come right. in of course good yeah. yes. not, not to be denied <laughs> <laughs> okay hmm. well does does anyone this else have any yeah this is what, my head hurts from thinking so hard this is deep <laughs> stuff caitlin <laughs> oh gosh you know i really feel oh, like cool. i just i did a very shallow yeah i'm gonna here i'll hold up this book this is one of the, like this giant tome. I have tomes and tomes. This is the handbook of executive functioning. I mean, there, there's just so much. Yeah. The more and more we learn about the brain, I mean, it's just, it's, it's really fascinating and helping people function and do better. Okay. I have a question that's slightly related and slightly not. Um, so if you have somebody who has executive dysfunctioning, um, and they're told, okay, I think meditation will help you try meditating. How, how would you go about explaining how to even do that to somebody who has executive dysfunctioning and cannot figure that out? Right. Well, so probably what we would start with, and I actually have people have written books on this, of course. Right. Um, right. so we'd start with a very concrete skills doing breathing so we do the smell of flower blow out a candle and to just start with that and make them mindful of their breath that's how i would start it and then maybe go on after that but i mean a lot of the times individuals with really severe executive function issues are pretty disconnected from their, their feelings and their body. Um, a lot of our kids will have some pretty dramatic acting out behaviors. And you ask them, you know, what happened? Were you mad? Were you, and I don't know. I don't know. You know, so to start getting them to feel their body, which is, you know, one of the, the um, things that occupational therapy can help them do too. So just, what books do you have that, you, I mean, you just mentioned you have books. I do, I do. They're, they're back in my office. I actually have a series on teaching. I think it's, I'm going to have to look. Oh, I will, um, I'll make sure Mel 
I give the title to Mel. I'll put out a list. All right, I'll get I'll get a list to Mel, and we'll we'll uh, publish it for the Autism Society. I actually have a book on helping individuals with intellectual disabilities learn to do relaxation and meditation. Oh, that I love that. Yeah, yeah I'd like to see that book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of looked at it, and I was like, and it, it t- does some ABA techniques, like how to teach. Yeah you to do these things using ABA. And I was like, wow, I have not gotten to try that anymore yet. So maybe I, I should come over and mess with Thatcher. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. right. Do you think Thatcher would like to meditate with me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that when we started doing one, one time we tried to help Jay get acclimated to possibly getting a massage and it was, it took a long time, but it was such a neat um, progression, you know, to watch him because he went from the point where he didn't even want the person to touch his hand to when he saw her coming, he would just jump up on the table, (laughs) you know, but that, but it just shows you how, you know, you just have to take a little bit, I guess, different approach, you know, to, to meet his needs and stuff. But anyway, So I think it helped him from an executive function standpoint, because he was really, he was really relaxed. You know, I'd never seen him that, that, that calm before. So. Yeah, no, I I think, I think that would definitely work. And again, it's breaking it into small tasks, Mm -hmm. getting someone to just immediately get it and, and go with it. Mm Okay, Chad just sent me a good text. All right. <laughs> well, this uh, has been awesome. Thank you. So I like how we kind of got into the massage. <laughs> relaxed. It's always a pleasure to come and talk to the Autism Society of the Bluegrass. Oh, oh thank you so much. I'm very glad to have you back. It's always yes, nice. I am. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. If anyone else has any questions here or if anyone wants to send any on the Zoom call, feel free. You have just a second. Otherwise, I would. Sorry. You can go. Facebook, there are no questions there, um, but I keep checking back um, and I've seen nothing so far. Okay. All right. Well, to just to um, let you know, Dr. Ellen, as I was saying that there have been positives to the pandemic, um, we will have many more people, way more people viewing this on the platforms and on our YouTube channel than we ever would have had at our in-person meetings. So, yeah, I don't know if that's a good thing or not. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Okay. Posterity, you're there. All right. Right. You're there. Yeah, you know, I, I I did some trainings at the University of Tennessee when I was there, and I had someone come up to me like years later. Hey, I saw you, and I was like, Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> It'll happen. Right. It'll happen. All right. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Thank you, Mel, for inviting me. <laughs> oh, no, you're always you. welcome. You're part yeah. of our day. Everyone who is on this call tonight or who is watching over um, Facebook Live or looks at this uh, at any point on the YouTube channel, know that everyone is always welcome at these meetings. And we meet the last Monday of most months. We will not have a meeting in May because of Memorial Day, but uh, we're 6.30 p.m. on the last Monday of most months. So you can find us at asbg.org if you're just if you've just happened upon our YouTube channel sometime in the future, and uh, find out. Uh, also, we have a, a look at our Facebook page, which has uh, our upcoming announce our upcoming meetings on them. So everyone is always welcome. And Remember these meetings required. also get posted. Um, like even before the pandemic, there were a lot of meetings that were getting posted to the YouTube channel. So if you go back and you're interested in a topic we've covered before, you can go back and view those videos. Right. For people who've let us film them. Yes. 
we have years of meetings now on our YouTube channel. It includes some workshops that we have uh, have put on and that sort of thing. So everyone is always welcome. Well, Dr. Allen, thank you so much again for being with us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure as always. Great information. We right. so appreciate it. Thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Come back anytime. <laughs> We'll see you again at the last Monday of April. And when did I say that was? And that's going to feature, uh, that's going to be April 26th. And that will feature Dr. Paul Wayman of Virginia Commonwealth University talking about um, employment for individuals with uh, significant uh, challenges. So. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks to everyone. Have a good night. Night. Thank good you. Night. Thank you. Good night.